Hi everyone, I'm Missy. I'm the marketing director of Rent Moolah. It's a fintech startup. And what we do is we make rental payments more inclusive. And we make the whole process of renting everything from finding an apartment, getting your security deposit, your rent, talking to your landlord, all that simpler for tenants and, and landlords. So we, I've been in marketing for over 15 years. Um, this is, I have a ton of experience in startups. Uh, this company is the third, third startup that I've helped scaled successfully from the ground up. Uh, also have lots of e-commerce and direct to consumer experience. Um, before all of that, I was in, uh, working in multinational agencies like Leo Burnett and Publicis in the creative department. Um, and I was doing traditional advertising, TV, radio, print. Um, so uh, my strengths are in branding, messaging, and scaling high-performance marketing teams for startups. Excellent. Thank you. Rajit, you just made it. How about you introduce yourself? Hello, all. Uh, my name is uh, Ranjit Edlabadkar. Uh, I'm with uh, Personal Capital, and my role uh, is uh, Director of Marketing Optimization. For uh, folks who are not aware of Personal Capital, Personal Capital is a remote delivery industry-leading digital wealth management company. Uh, we do the right thing every day by serving investors uh, and managing their money. Uh, by taking a 360 degree approach and our state of the uh, state of the art tools and technologies provide investors a complete financial picture and our registered investment advisors provide expert guidance and logical strategies to help them meet their financial goals. Uh, in my role at personal capital, I focus on um, primarily two things. One is optimizing our media investments, which are focused on, we are a big uh, direct-to-consumer marketing uh, company where we drive uh, new customers to start using our tools. So I focus on optimizing and getting the, maximizing the return on our media investments. And then I also uh, focus on our website and our mobile app conversion uh, uh, optimization as well. Excellent, thank you. Laura, how about you tell us about yourself, please? Sure, thank you. So my name is Laura Wastoff and I am the Senior Director of Media at 8560. So that is an ad agency here in San Diego. Um, I've been in advertising for 14 years and I've been at agencies that whole time. Um, I am now over a team of 16 people all doing paid media. So uh, paid search, social, so anything on uh, Google, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, anything that you see on websites. I'm over a team of buyers who, who run all those ads. Um, before I was a, a director over a team of people, I was hands-on platform myself, just being um, in, in the media channels as a media buyer, buying on all of the different platforms that I just named. Um, and my agency specializes in some travel accounts, some CPG, um, some e-com and, and direct-to-consumer products. So locally, we have uh, Kula, Bear Republic sunscreens. Uh, we have the Icon Pass, Mammoth, some, some things like that. So I get to work on some gr pretty great brands um, and work with all the you know, relevant media channels. Excellent. Thank you. And then Magnus, batting cleanup. Tell us a little bit about yourself. All right, last but not least. So uh, you can probably tell by my background, I work at a company called BD that you may or may not have heard about. Uh, BD is one of the largest med tech companies in the world and um, it has a significant presence here in San Diego as well. Uh, if you've gotten your COVID shot, there's a really good chance that it was in a BD syringe. We're work leaders in syringes, um, as well as you, you get your blood drawn, it goes into those little plastic containers, uh, that's probably also a BD container. Uh, but we also make large capital equipment. So I work with products that uh, manage medications in hospitals, and those are larger uh, capital equipment type, type products. I'm responsible for upstream product marketing and really product line management, um, business management for a $900 million business called Pixis at BD. Uh, so that's mainly upstream product marketing, product marketing, um, doing research on trends, deciding what's next, what the direction the business should take, the strategy for the business, 
what we should invest in doing doing the research to make sure we design the right products set the right to find the right requirements taking them to market etc and it's in doing that around the world it's a global business so um doing that in, in all parts of the world and requirements can be can be quite different in in healthcare prior to bd i was in the tech industry for over 15 years and uh I've done marketing all my life. I've done everything in marketing, started in part marketing, but I've done advertising in between, PR, uh, channel management, um, you name it. Uh, and really enjoying it. And uh, back in part marketing, which, which is great. And a little fun, fun fact, uh, I also uh, started teaching a bit at Ready, and I see at least two familiar names here uh, uh, among the students who are, who are on the panel. So um, uh, really enjoying that part as well. Excellent, thank you. And let me tell, uh, for the students who are joining us, let me tell you a little bit about how this panel is going to go. I'm going to ask some set questions that each panelist will take a turn answer answering. These will be about like 30,000 foot view questions to kind of give you a general idea about uh, some typical uh, marketing deliverables, skills, insights, trends that are happening. And then I'm going to open it back up to you guys, the audience. So while they're answering my questions, Think about questions that you would like to answer. Maybe it's something specific to one person, or maybe it's a specific thing or subject about marketing that you would like uh, their advice or their expertise on. So then it'll be your chance to shine and ask questions as well. So first, let's talk about trends. Um, I'm very curious to know how um, COVID has impacted your business and how you guys uh, strategize around um, COVID when it comes to marketing or how it's impacted the way that you do things. Um, and so Magnus, why don't you kick us off? All right, uh, well, in, in healthcare, the primary go-to-market channel is still a good old traditional sales force, meeting with, with either physicians or meeting in our case with pharmacists. The best way to do that is a B2B sale is by having a salesperson go there, meet the customer, build a relationship, uh, talk through all the details and the specifics, and COVID, of course, threw a giant wrench into that. Uh, all of a sudden, overnight, no one could go and see a customer in person anymore. And we had to almost learn overnight how to sell, how to interact with our customers remotely via Zoom or Teams. And it's been a big challenge because that's really not in, been in the DNA of our sales force. So coming up with tools, it's a completely different sales process. And we had to develop that very quickly what was fascinating is um, kind of going through the cycles with COVID and the different surges. Um, at different times, our customers actually had quite a bit of downtime because a lot of surgeries, a lot of healthcare was canceled. So they actually had time to talk to us, which was great. Um, but then there were, of course, other times during surges where you just couldn't get a hold of them because they were busy with um, saving patients' lives. So uh, that's been interesting too, kind of going, going through those cycles. Excellent. And then what, how do you predict um, for the future? Like what are going to be some trends for the future you think in marketing? I think it's, it's going to be really interesting to see post COVID what, where we're going to net out. Are we going to go all the way back to where we were before? I don't think so. I think we've learned a lot that a lot of things can be done remotely and you can be impact, impactful remotely. Uh, so I think it will be some form of hybrid, but I think the proof is done in the pudding we'll all have to learn and see what works. Um, outside of that, account-based marketing is definitely uh, big for us and a, and, and a big trend and something we have to hear. And other industries have, are usually ahead of healthcare. We're, we're usually laggards um, when it comes to adoption of new technologies or new methods, but uh, account-based marketing is definitely a big push for us. Excellent, thank you. Laura, how about for you? What are some trends uh, that are happening within your company and how has COVID impacted uh, the way you guys strategize marketing and branding? Yeah, so we really saw a few different ends of the spectrum. So for a lot of our e-commerce clients and our D2C clients who are selling directly on their sites, they're not as reliant as people coming into stores. We actually saw a huge spike in the amount of sales they were seeing. Some of our clients only saw sales that were rivaled from like a Black Friday and they were seeing it week over week. So as much as there's a lot of talk about the downturn of the economy and the unemployment rates, we were actually seeing that a lot of people were home, they weren't going out, they were getting government checks. Um, and if their paychecks weren't affected, they actually had more 
um, free spending dollars. So we actually saw a lot of consumers just kind of spending more on products that they could buy them for themselves. Um, in the past, I've worked with like a um, athleisure brand. We have one of those now too. Um, snowboards, big ticket items that people were not buying in the past. People now, after not going out and, and saving some money, are actually have the, the spending power to do that. So we actually saw a lot of our brands actually spike in terms of revenue. And now they're trying to kind of keep that momentum going. But now we're fearful that once people are back to going out to dinner, going to the movies, just doing different things, are they actually going to be able to keep that revenue up? And then on the opposite end of it, we do have a lot of travel clients and they saw they saw the opposite. They obviously saw that people just weren't coming. Um, and we have a lot of ski resorts. So they were still pretty much open to a degree, but they weren't fully open. People couldn't really eat at the restaurants, even if they went to the resorts. So um, we definitely saw some of our clients who took a, a huge decrease in the amount of revenue they were seeing. Um, but it, you know, it really does vary wildly. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to know, so which um, consumer products spiked the most? So we saw spikes in, um, we have some activewear brands and some snowboard brands and things like that. And they did really well. Um, I am also friendly with a, a company that a stand up paddleboard company. They did really well. They, they did fantastic over the last year, even the entire year. Um, and then we have like a, a very high end, uh, like outdoor clothing brand and they did, did very, very well as well as well. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like anything that had to do with outdoor sports and active wear did really definitely, well. Definitely, definitely a trend there. But I think, um, I think people were also, you know, we saw like at home wine services and food delivery and then brands like that also not expect to have so much, you know, they, some brands were just, you know, actually trying to figure out how to accommodate all the volume that they were seeing. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Missy, how about for you? What were some trends and changes in the COVID area? Yeah, so we've seen a lot of very interesting shifts that I personally did not expect. So I'm in the, the fintech industry. Um, so fintech is one of those industry that really saw a lot of growth during the pandemic. And uh, it's really because, you know, um, even pre-pandemic, 78% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. And then the pandemic happened and, you know, um, people lost their jobs and things like that. Um, you know, pre-pandemic, people would struggle with like a surprise bill, unexpected bill of $400, understandably, if they're living paycheck to paycheck. Um, and what the pandemic did, is it just put all these issues in the forefront. Um, it just became a lot more apparent. So um, a lot of fintech companies, um, you know, got a lot of attention during during the COVID season. A lot of people needed first to pay digitally, contact free. There needed to be more flexible payment options um, and things like that. So we saw a lot of shifts there. But what's more interesting when I looked earlier this year is um, the payment, the the shifts in how payment how people managed payments and how, how they spent um, was really interesting to me. Like, for example, I know that um, as uh, Laura was saying that there's a big boom in e-commerce because people are at home and they're shopping online because they couldn't go to retail stores. Um, so e-commerce actually in the US grew like 44% in 2020. Um, and, but what's interesting is the payment methods shifted. So instead of credit cards, um, now you'll see uh, in the news, a lot of these companies like Klarna, Affirm, um, PayPal with their after, after pay, things like that have, have grown tremendously. 30% um, of the e-commerce payments were made with those buy now, pay later um, options where you split up the payments and enforce separate payments every two weeks or things like that. And it's interest free. So it's better than a credit card. Um, what's interesting to me is that across all uh, demographics, people, uh, cash on delivery rose. Like people are paying with cash. 33% paid with cash on delivery or with mobile, pay mobile payments like pay by text or QR code. Um, so when people buy, the difference is when people buy online, 
they they tend to go with the traditional debit credit buy now pay later is rising when they're in store they prefer to pay in cash mm-hmm. uh, 60% of people who bought in person used cash that's comparing it to 3% of people who who did like a, the tap to pay cards or digital payments which is to me very surprising because i like to tap my card and use my debit card mm-hmm. um, so that's pretty pretty interesting we also saw some shifts in terms of you know people just don't trust credit anymore they don't want to incur that interest they're starting to be smarter with their money um, yeah so so those are the interesting trends that we've seen and so since i'm in the rental space typically real estate um, like like the medical industry is a lot slower to adapt to these technologies. Um, and so what we do is we really focused on how can we bring all of these, the, the e-commerce access and, and you know, the ease of e-commerce into, into the rental space. So we're looking at those trends and being able to, you know, what if you can pay your, your rent in installments? That would be, you know, a lot simpler than, you know, half of your paycheck going uh, you know, you don't have money in the first half of the month versus, you know, spreading it out or getting an interest-free line of credit, things like that. Or be even with like your security deposit, for example, which is usually first and last, which is a big chunk. What if you can pay that in installments or maybe get a bond and only pay 10% of it and still be covered? So things like that, that we're, we're seeing to make um, things a little more uh, flexible for people. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, I remember um, right before the panel started, you told me that more people were paying in cash, and I was very yes. You. And I think that's kind of an interesting. Yeah, principle. and it, it's millennials and like all the <laughs> so I'm like, okay, cash, cash it is. But then, uh, but then on the flip side, I'm interested to hear now Ranjit's opinion on how things are going and what are some trends on the marketing side for his company as a result of COVID. So Ranjit, tell us, tell us. What's yeah, so uh, so we have seen uh, like maybe a couple of kind of tailwinds uh, for our business uh, due to like this whole uh, change that was driven uh, uh, due to COVID. Right, like first of all, we were always in this. Uh, environment of providing financial advice in a in a in a remote uh, way, right? Our financial advisors, though they are spread across the U.S., they're not necessarily co-located with their uh, clients. And uh, with in the in the sort of like the post-COVID era, like being remote become became a norm, right? And so that was a big sort of a tailwind for our uh, for our business, where um, some some folks might have preferred that they have a financial advisor that's in their same city or maybe in their locality, whom, whom they can go and meet. And now, like everyone is recognizing that, hey, you can just as well have a quick uh, video conference with your financial advisor and get. Uh, get that uh, advice that you were looking for without having to travel and meet personally. So that was a big tailwind for us. And uh, to further capitalize on it, what we also did was we decided to be uh, remote forever. Like, so uh, like when things get back to normal, we'll still open up our offices, but all our uh, employees have the option to work uh, from wherever they want to in the US. So that has given a lot of flexibility to our uh, associates, as well as from a recruiting perspective, it gives us a, a kind of a pretty wide pool of talent that we can recruit for. We no longer are saying that, hey, you might need to move to the Bay Area or you might need to move to Denver. You can be located anywhere in the US. Uh, and so that those were like a f- certainly some positives for our business. Uh, the other thing which um, has happened is with the uh, with the stimulus payment, with people saving more, there's been a uh, a renewed interest in investing. Uh, there's a lot more uh, uh, folks who are getting into uh, the stock markets and looking for investing ideas. And so that's generated a lot of buzz and it's it's also helping us uh, in, 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 in the sense that we have the financial tools that can help you track how you're doing in your uh, investments, even if you are managing them yourself. Um, 
and and I, I think in terms of uh, competition, what we are seeing is there is uh, certainly an increased competition from what we call as the robos, which are uh, like your Betterment or Wealthfront. These uh, firms are also growing substantially and offering sort of a low touch investment choice. While we um, sit so, sort of somewhere in between uh, like a traditional financial advisor versus a robot advisor where we have the tools and technologies that uh, a, a robo advisor might offer. But at the same time, we have uh, kind of, uh, you, you have dedicated uh, financial advisors that are available to you and can help you and, uh, and kind of tailor the, um, uh, the investments and the portfolio decisions for your specific situations. Um, in, in terms of uh, marketing, again, um, I, I would say like we've, uh, uh, we, we are focusing on on driving uh, not just uh, leads into our business through our paid media, but we also have a big focus on what we call as earned leads, which is using our, uh, we have been able to uh, put out a lot of uh, blog related content, which is uh, lots of kind of interesting financial and for uh, news and information, which we also uh, publish through, uh, through our PR team on other publishers. And that has been able to get us uh, a lot of name recognition as well as leads coming into our site, which we don't necessarily have to pay for uh, through paid media. Um, interesting. And I'm, I'm, I'm very interested to hear that your company has decided that they're going to stay fully remote in the workplace. Um, how do you think that's going to then impact uh, your ability to generate, you know, new clients and, and things if you're not, if you're not doing like those face-to-face in-person meetings anymore, or will that still happen? Yeah, no, uh, I, I think uh, we haven't missed a beat. We uh, literally in a week's time decided that everyone is going to be remote and we haven't kind of shown back at our offices since like uh, March 2020. Mm -hmm. And um, in, in fact, what we are realizing is that our advisors are now able to take much more appointments, serve a lot more clients, and 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 be available when they need to. Um, and and the the good part is that we already were set up to be in a in a remote uh, environment from an from a financial advice perspective. But what has really helped is that all the customers are also recognizing that hey, this is. It's not uncommon for me to just get onto a uh, onto a Zoom call with my financial advisor. Mm -hmm. okay. Excellent, thank you. Um, let's talk a little bit about skills, Laura. I'm interested to know um, what sort of uh, skills do you need in order to be successful in your role? And feel free to mention like hard skills, soft skills, and um, if there's any kind of analytics that you use in your role as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, I would say that first off, everyone in media now is analytical. It's kind of like you have to be by nature. It's it's really a heads down kind of job where you're pulling large data sets, normalizing, aggregating data, looking for trends. There is a shift where more is being done by the platforms, but it's still supplemented a lot by what the humans can, can look at and see. And we do work really closely with our data science teams. So the media team and the the data and reporting teams do work really closely together. Um, but I think in general, just being in paid media and advertising, one of the most important things is just having drive. Um, it seems silly to say, because you need to have that, you know, probably to be successful anywhere, but you can always kind of tell who's going to get ahead because they're the ones who are kind of there at the end of the day. And if they have any bandwidth, they're learning something new and they're the ones who kind of have their heads down a little later, um, just te teaching themselves like on their own, whatever they can learn and just volunteering to kind of like do the next thing that no one knows how to do yet, which always happens in media because there's a new platform or there's a new type of product. So the one who's willing to kind of jump in and, and do that is, is kind of the one who gets ahead. Um, I think in addition, what was that? I said somebody who's proactive. Very proactive, yeah. And then I think accountability is really important, just knowing that you have your work to do and you need to be able to put your signature basically on the end of anything you're gonna submit. And it needs to have that level of accuracy and and you know really be something you'd wanna kind of put, put to the public because everything that we do essentially is public and it, and it runs and people see it. Um, 
And then I think just intelligence is really important, but so are those soft skills um, because we're heads down in the platforms a lot. And it's, it's almost like a level of like being in analytics and being like a coder and you have to be really fine kind of working on your own and, and just working with those data sets. But then if you additionally have those people skills, I think it really helps to kind of separate the people who are going to be able to elevate and be in a room of 20 clients explaining what they're doing versus just being in the back end, um, kind of being able to do it themselves. Can you mention specifically which platforms that you, that you work on or work with a lot? Yeah, so we mainly work with Google. So Google encompasses um, YouTube. They have their own display ads and obviously search ads and now they have travel ads and Google's just its own like microcosm for what you can do within the advertising space. Um, Facebook and Instagram, which are one platform. Um, we also run on Reddit, TikTok, Pinterest prim primarily. I know a lot of brands run on Twitter too. Um, that's not one that we work with a ton. Um, and then we work on DSPs, which is a place where you can run um, large scale display campaigns like the Trade Desk, uh, DB360, which is also a Google product, which gets a little confusing. Um, and then we run direct with um, client, with uh, platforms too and, and with publishers. So we'll, we'll work with a BuzzFeed and New York Times, something like that directly as well. So those are the main ones. My um, team doesn't do the Amazon ads, but that's another um, big paid media platform for ads. Thank you. Magnus, how about for you and BD? What sort of hard and soft skills and analytics do you use in your role? Yeah, uh, for us, uh, healthcare being healthcare, there are, many, there are many jobs where healthcare experience or healthcare knowledge is a requirement. So healthcare is just a little unique, a little different because of the regulations that you have, because of all the different stakeholders are having. There are definitely roles where that prior knowledge or experience is really important and we typically hire people that come from the industry or that have some experience there. So that's that's definitely definitely one, uh, but it's not a requirement for all roles and it is definitely possible to get into a healthcare company without having prior healthcare experience. You just have to maybe be a little bit more patient if it doesn't work out for the first job, then maybe it's something else where that isn't as much of a requirement or the company is looking for something different um, and is willing to forego the, the healthcare experience. I think other uh, skills that are really important is being a team player and, and EQ, um, being able to work well with people, being able to work well with, with teams. It's a large company, we're very matrix. It's a very complex business. Uh, you can't figure it out by yourself. You can't do everything by yourself. Uh, you, we're only gonna be successful as a team. And the company has very strongly recognized that uh, to the extent where uh, the annual bonus now doesn't have an individual component anymore and how the bonus is being determined. It's purely based on the success of the team, um, which is interesting because it's already, you can already feel it's changing some of the dynamics internally. And uh, there's other large companies like Microsoft that have done this. And I think it's a move in the right direction and it's avoiding some of that comp internal competition between individuals and it's really getting people to work more more as a team, so that's that's really important. Um, analytics, uh, I would fully agree with Laura. Even though we're a different industry, analytics are very very important. There's a lot of data, and being able to dissect that data, analyze its segment, uh, is definitely important. And then also uh, financial acumen uh, or com acumen for for the commercial side of, of a business. I think that's that's important too here for for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are two there are two really great things that you said that I want to point out. So he said that you don't necessarily have to have a science background to get into a science company, although it might be a little bit tougher. But I, this is a question I often get from students who have an interest in healthcare or the life sciences, but they don't have that traditional BS degree. You know, how do how can I get in? It is possible. And then he also mentioned teamwork. Now I know in all of our programs, all of you guys have to do teamwork projects whether you want to or not. But this sounds like, you know, if you get out into and go out into work, you're gonna be working in teams and the success is, is in your ability to, to work as a team. So I thought those were two really great points that you made. So thank you for that. Ranjit, how about for you? What are some, some hard, soft skills? Um, and then how do you utilize analytics in your role? Oh, Ranjit, you're on mute. 
Right. Yeah, completely uh, agree with what Laura and Magnus were saying that marketing is now is becoming more and more data driven, very less um, kind of uh, just subjective decision making. Uh, so that's that's certainly a focus for us. But at the same time, uh, a couple of things I would add uh, in addition to what was said is is customer centricity, right? Like when we are getting customers to trust their hard earned money with us, we have to deliver a amazing customer experience and we have to address all their concerns and questions and all of that. So that is one of the main uh, things that we focus on, uh, on, on like the whole customer journey. Uh, what are some of the, how do we understand their goals? How do we personalize our experience uh, so that they are, uh, they feel the trust uh, to uh, to do business with us, so that is one thing, and then um, I would say in addition to that, uh, like being data driven, what we also are focused on is testing and learning, right? Like there's always at least five to 10 tests that we are running, whether it's on our website, whether it's on our uh, uh, TV campaigns, whether it's on our digital campaigns, we are always testing new creatives, new ways of targeting uh, customers uh, and new experiences on our website for, for customers that are coming in. So that's that's been a big focus and that sort of a notion of continuous improvement, like not just be happy with the status quo that, hey, we have a homepage, it's working well, but that's great, but how can I make it better? Like what are the other things that I should be testing for? And so that's been a, a pretty strong sort of culture within personal capital. Thank you, thank you for that. Missy, for you, skills that are needed and how do you utilize analytics? Yes. Um, so for start, I, I, I'll talk through the startup experience for this one, because it's like, you know, when you're at a startup and, and you don't have data, you're, you're entering the, the, the industry cold. I mean, you know, and so what you do, what I've always done is, you know, as a marketer, although I, I have tons, years and years of experience behind me, I never approach it as I can tell you what's going to work because the truth is no matter what, you know, you don't know what channels will work. You don't know what messaging will, you, will work. You are, you may have an idea of who's going to convert, who's going to find your, your product useful, but you're not entirely sure. So you kind of work backwards and, and you know, make educated guesses as to what, what might work, what channels um, might work for you. Like, for example, you know, maybe it's not necessarily Facebook and Instagram. Maybe it's more um, publications, especially if it's like a, um, and edu like, you know, if it's an entirely new product that you need to educate people on. So it has to be more long form content. And so what you do is you build, you know, make your best guess there, um, build, build it so you can track the, the customer, the funnel and, and see like how people are behaving. Um, you know, we, we've done in the past, we've built, built it very slowly where every month we had like a set budget for just experiments. So every every month we would choose a different platform or a different avenue to do experiments in. Not all of them will work, um, but the, the ones that do, you keep them on and like, you know, you, you kind of grow it from there. Um, there's, you know, so that's that's what I've seen. It's that real obsession with, with let me try to experiment um, what will work, that, that curiosity. So I think that the, the, a key soft skill will be that um, you always in marketing in general, not just like in analytics or anything in any role, uh, you have to keep learning the, the moment you stop being curious, you will become an outdated, um, dinosaur because, you know, there's always new platforms coming out. Like now clubhouse is a thing. And so you kind of have to be curious and go into there and see how people are, are, are monetizing that and using that. Um, and then what we've done in the past too is as you start building data, really um, it's, I've worked with analysts in the past where, oh, this is what the data says, but really the, the, the key, if people are behaving this way, but the key is what do you do with that information? What recommendations can you make? Like, oh, we should just stick with this because this is what's working. No, but you have to look at where is there other potential? What other things can we do? 
what does the data, what's the story that the data um, presents and how can you use that to kind of be more relevant to your, your customer base or, or grow that a little bit better. Um, so that's, that's what I would say, just like for any role, uh, just keep experimenting. Yeah. I love what you said about curiosity. I think that's true in any role that these students go after. You have to stay curious. Otherwise, how will you grow and how will you better yourself? So I would now like to open this up to our students. Um, so you can either type a question in the chat box if you'd like, or if you wanna be brave and ask a question on Zoom, uh, feel free to unmute yourself. And uh, please, let's hear from the students. What questions do you guys have? Susan raised her hand, you can go first. Hi, I'm Susan. I'm from the full-time MBA program. I think Missy just had a great point about startup and that my question is actually around startup. I think many of you mentioned that you have startup experience and then at Ready, I think we really like foster this entrepreneur. And then we have a lot of programs that help students to develop their startup ideas. So my question is from your experience, your, like your experience working with startup, what are the common marketing mistakes that you see startup founder they make? And what are your advice for students who want to develop their own product and then put it into the market? Yes. Um, yeah, that's a good question. And my answer will be so not intuitive to what I do because I do branding. So I would say a lot of startup um, founders and companies, um, they try to make it perfect right away. Uh, and like, oh, this is the brand, we'll stick to this. Uh, you know, there's no flexibility. This is, this is it. This is the color. This is, you know, this is our target audience. This is what we do. Um, and what they always say with startups is if you're not ashamed of your first product, then you're not doing it right. So it's always like for startups, done is better than perfect. I wouldn't say the same for, for other, other situations. Um, but like I said, for startups, the first year, if you really want to grow fast, you just have to keep experimenting. You have to keep adjusting your product. You have to keep looking at what works and what doesn't work and adjust from there. I've done um, like for one product, for example, that I've launched in the past, I don't know how many packaging changes um, and name changes and, and how many branding changes. Um, you know, it's not, it's not gonna hurt the integrity of your brand. You're small, people don't know you yet. Once you skyrocket, then that's when you actually really build that that brand and then start working on the brand personality all that stuff thank you thank you susan is there anybody else on the panel you would like to have that answer i think it's a great question like just what are some common marketing pitfalls or marketing mistakes if anybody else on the panel would like to share their experiences with that um i can jump in really quick i think one of the things that i see with brands who are just like start, starting in market happen a lot is they always come to us and they say, we want to make a million dollars this year. It's like every new brand wants to make $1 million in the first year. And then they'll go to a marketing agency and say, we have $20,000 to spend. How are we going to make a million dollars this year? So I would say, um, do your research, connect with other entrepreneurs, connect with other brands, get a real timeline for what your first year might look like, what your first six, six months might look like, and really position yourselves for your own success. Because I think a lot of brands just come out of nowhere and they're like, we're gonna get funding, we're gonna make all this money. And it's not realistic. And if that's your goal, you're not gonna step into it the right way. Um, maybe you need to start with some guerrilla marketing. Maybe you need to start being a little scrappy with what you do. And, and I think if you don't, kind of set yourself up like that in the beginning. I mean, look, strive for the million dollars. Like, absolutely, like don't sell yourself short, but at the same time, be realistic for what your first quarter is gonna look like and how you should get there, as opposed to just, you know, going for those really kind of more exorbitant numbers. Now that you said that, I wanted to add to it um, because yes, they, they, it's almost like make it happen. You don't yeah. have to budget and I've done that many times somehow, and that's where you just really have to be very creative um, in terms of, you, you know, you have to be a little kind of brave and, uh, you know, try disruptive messaging or try, you know, really doing things. If you listen to one of the best podcasts I listen to is How I Built This by Guy Raz, and it really goes through how companies 
built their companies and you'll see that their stories in the beginning, they really hustle hard. Um, and, and like, it's the most surprising things that, that make it work. It's called, so you said your podcast is called how I built this. Yeah. How I built this. It's, it's really good. They feature a lot of big companies and how they grow. Great. We have a, a question in the chat from Yvonne. Uh, do you notice any changing trends in terms of whether companies are bringing more marketing advertising in-house versus using agencies or the reverse? Great question. Yeah, maybe. Uh, yeah, I can speak to that. So um, what I'm seeing is a, is a trend towards leveraging niche agencies for some of the newer media opportunities uh, and uh, as, as the platforms uh, that Laura was mentioning, especially from Google, Facebook, and their capabilities get better and better and uh, those channels become more established. There's a trend to bring some of those established media buys in-house. Um, like there are still quite a few companies which would have like an agency of record, but there's um, a bit of a move towards um, engaging niche agencies that specialize in, in what they do. So for instance, for personal capital, we work across eight different agencies, each kind of focused on their different niche. And, and that model has been working really well for us. I can, I can maybe comment a little bit here from the larger company side, but uh, I have all the companies I've worked at, um, HP, Kodak, Qualcomm, uh, BD, we've always used um, outsourced or external agencies. And it just gives you more flexibility. You can move agencies, you can get a different team. Um, I think there's a lot of value in being able to tap into different resources into hiring a different team, hiring a different agency, getting fresh thinking, getting fresh ideas, getting people with different experiences in. And that's just a little bit harder to do uh, when you have an in-house agency. So I, I kind of see that probably continuing, um, but it also depends on the business and the goals. There's probably cases to be made and some cases to, to bring marketing in-house, but from what I've seen, it's mostly external. Let's see, we've got a question wow, text from Heidi. So regarding finding good fit for your teams, what would you recommend for people who have a background in sales or other teams that work closely with marketing to help them actually break into marketing roles? Would you recommend just applying or trying to get in by means of moving around teams once internal? And yeah, too, I think just a broader question too is just, you know, if, if people want to break into marketing or if they don't necessarily have that marketing background, how do they, how do they get in? I think that's a great question. Yeah, um, I can speak to that a little bit because I worked with sales teams in the past and like have hired. Marketing is one of those roles. Um, you know, every time I, I put any marketing, literally any marketing job post out there, um, a bunch of like people with different backgrounds um, apply. A lot of people do wanna, like even if it's like completely not relevant, you know, um, they do. So I, I would say it, it depends on, um, how do I say this? So, so in marketing, there's no such thing as a full stack marketer. You, even if there are companies who post jobs, like I want you to do PR, branding, paid media, you know, people do that, but you need to really figure out um, what you want to specialize in, like what are the skill, where do you want to go, for example, which, which part of marketing and figure out the skills that, that would be a good fit there and what's the starting point. So if, for example, if it's sales and like you're really good at, that could be like, you could be a very good direct response marketer because, you know, it's almost like a direct sales, but for marketing or, you know, things like that, that you look. So you, you just have to see that when you're looking for a job, just make sure that you fit the requirements, the skill sets that they need, um, because the first step is to be able to deliver what they need. And then um, after that, what really will differentiate you after you get your foot in the door with an interview is how, you, how well you fit into the company um, culture, your working style, you know, so do your research. Um, but I would say, uh, just from my experience, I don't know about the, the rest of the panel, that if you are, are starting out, um, wanting to get into marketing, I would say agencies are a good place to go 
because you get, and there's different kinds of agencies, right? Um, because you get tons and tons of experience. You get to work with different brands in a short period of time. Uh, I would say that uh, as I look at sort of the different marketing uh, departments that I've been in, there are like four to five kind of key or distinct roles that that you will see across all marketing teams. And I'll, I'll uh, kind of list those. And so I would say that depending on kind of what you have been doing, if you can align yourself to one or more of these and show that you can you have skills and expertise that can translate over and you can do that work, then that should uh, certainly open the, those doors for you. So at a high level, I would say like kind of things that's most common are like you have your traditional, uh, and then my experience has been mostly in direct to consumer marketing. So I'll talk to that. Like you have your traditional marketing managers that are owning the media uh, placements uh, or media buying decisions in one or more channels, right? Like that's like at the core of a lot of marketing teams. You have uh, marketing research, which is focused on getting customer insights, uh, looking at your uh, brand metrics, uh, bringing in feedback from customers on your creative before launching them. So there's a big field around customer research. Uh, we all talked about analytics. So you could be very data-driven and technical, and you could then abstract or move those skills into uh, mining data that can drive insights that inform your media investment decisions. Um, the other area that I've seen is around um, content, uh, and PR, right? Like uh, those are uh, like where you can build new content, you can um, work with publishers and get uh, pr uh, press for your company. So that's another uh, team. And then um, creative, right? Like if you have graphic skills, you can build new creatives. And um, I'm sure like I might've missed something, but those were the like if you think about the core marketing teams, then um, those come to mind. I would also recommend you kind of put yourself in the, into the shoes of the hiring manager uh, who is looking for an advertising manager, a product manager, whatever the role may be. Uh, and you have multiple people applying. If you're someone who doesn't have marketing experience, but there are other candidates that have multiple years of marketing experience, it's really hard for the hiring manager to say, well, I'm going to go with the person that has no marketing experience versus the candidate that has multiple years of marketing experience. So you have to somehow overcome that. And I think uh, like, like Missy and, and Ranjit said, I think a good, really good race, you have to somehow get to know that person and demonstrate other skills to them that you're, you're really good interpersonally, you're really organized, you maybe you know the product really well, but just maybe from a technical side or from a support side or whatever it may be, or the sales side. Um, and then they, they can imagine, okay, maybe this person can do, can do marketing, I'll have to train them, but they bring other things. You have to show them that you bring something else to the table um, that is valuable, um, where the, person, the hiring manager is then willing to say, okay, I'm gonna train you in marketing, and you, you're gonna have a learning curve, but you bring something else in that I want on my team. Um, and I, th I think generally doing it, uh, making that switch into a different function internally is definitely easier because you're exposed to people. You can you can also do just do a project. You can knock on marketing's door and say, "Hey, can I do a project for you? You know, give me give me something, and I'll I just want to spend ten percent of my time doing a marketing project. I want to see what that's like." And all of a sudden, now you have a foot in the door of the marketing team. And Missy, you made me think of a funny story. Somebody said, and it's so true. Everyone thinks they know marketing. They've taken one marketing course somewhere and they think they know marketing. I, I had uh, years ago, I was posting a job for an international product manager and a guy applied who was a limo driver in San Diego. And he said, I'm very qualified for this job because I pick up people from all over the world all the time at the airport. And I know the world and I'm, I'm ready to do international marketing, so. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, one well, thing- How you sell yourself, right? How you sell your experience. Absolutely. It, it, totally, I mean, it was a great story. It was a great story. 
It, one thing I would say that actually worked for us, because it's like we have an HR person who screens everybody before they hand them over to the hiring manager. So if you, you might come across that, what I would do is just message um, either the CEO or whoever it heads up marketing directly on LinkedIn and just show your excitement. Because that has happened to us where, you know, a person um, applied, didn't get through the screening because of the lack of, uh, you know, years of experience or whatever, message the CEO and the CEO, oh, passed it along like this guy, you know, so now he got interviewed because, you know, he just like messaged the CEO and our HR person will not say no to our CEO. Um, so you, you just have to like, uh, you know, be, be a little, they'll appreciate that you really want to be part of the company. Sometimes that's what it takes. It's like, I, I really want to be part of your company. Mm-hmm. And another skill set that's uh, I forgot to mention is, uh, and it's, it's, it's at the heart of, of big marketing teams is like marketing ops or project management. And those are skills that can be relatively kind of easily transferred over. Um, and then so that might be another uh, avenue to explore that if you are highly organized and can bring in that project management skills or program management skills, those are also sought after in, uh, in marketing departments. Also, I want to circle back and say, if you're, if you're thinking about messaging a CEO of a company, maybe reach out to your Rady Career Advisor first. Because I think there's there's a right way to message the CEO and make a good impression, and there's a wrong way to do it. So maybe just run your message by your career advisor first and let them take a look at it. Um, there is one question on here I want to ask because I think it's a really interesting one, and it comes from Ariella. Um, and in particular, Laura, I'd like you to start off since you work with uh, companies who do consumer goods. Ariella, would you want to be brave and ask it yourself? <laughs> Sure, I can do that. Hi, everyone. This has been a great discussion. I've really enjoyed it. Um, My question is, you know, the topic of influencers, where do you see those influencers going? And for example, those people on LinkedIn, not on LinkedIn, but on Instagram, who have a million followers, and they try to get all kinds of free swag. And, (laughs) and do they really, are they really brand ambassadors? Do you really see that being a long term kind of engagement or do you see that fizzling out? Yeah, so um, I think there's a right way and a wrong way to do it, first of all. I mean, if you're choosing influencers where half of their posts are paid content, essentially, you're not gonna get um, the same type of response. We also see that we get a better response from micro-influencers that actually have like less than a thousand um, or less than even like 10,000 followers because the other ones are so big, they don't actually get the engagement back, but the micro-influencers, um, they feel a closer connection to. It's like a stronger sense of community. They're actually, they actually feel like they're being heard and, and that they're hearing them. Um, I do think with all the changes happening with paid media, so um, there's a lot of changes happening right now. Apple is about to push out an update. So basically um, all the Facebook data that we get from different websites, uh, most of it will not pass back into Facebook anymore. So we're kind of losing a lot of what we're able to do with Facebook advertising. And by 2022, there's going to be a deprecation of cookies. So everyone's scrambling to find new ways to actually track consumers and target consumers and prove that ads are working. So I do think during this period where we are losing some of what we're used to and we haven't figured out what to do yet, influencers will actually be even more important because at least they have people they're talking to directly they know what they're interested in, but I think maybe if we can rebound from all these changes that are happening, they might start to mi- diminish from there. But I would say for now, for the near future, they're definitely definitely here to stay. Anybody else have a, a comment on that? Well, I, I've done influencer marketing. Oh, and, and oh, I can just sidebar you, Laura, because there it was something that we did in the past to get more data because we're not getting anything from Facebook. Um, <laughs> So I've, I've done influencer marketing um, for a while, way back in the beginning where they paid Kim Kardashian to, to like promote that tea. Uh, and that's why they need to hashtag ad. Um, so back then, yes, it was like quality over quantity. And the shift has now become 
more even in branding it's like people buy from from brands and, and people they trust and so it's really about um finding influencers that really believe in what you do um because it'll come out naturally i do think it's it's here to stay i mean old school old school influencers are just endorsers you know what i mean and so this time there's just you have a lot more endorsers to choose from and there are ways to take a look there are platforms where you can take a look at where are where's their follower base what's their engagement do you, you know um do, will this this really work and, and things like that but the key is really to find somebody who's bringing value to their audience and who would really fit fit your brand and what you what you do and what you believe in and like if if they would use the product and endorse it and they would love it then their audience will as well mm -hmm. excellent guys we have one minute i feel like there are so many more questions that we could ask but to continue this conversation, if students would like to reach out to you, uh, maybe to talk more, to do more of an informational interview, what's a good way for them to reach you? Is it LinkedIn? Is it email? Is it Instagram? What, uh, how, how can students connect with you further? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it's just guess the email, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. Yeah, you can guess my email or LinkedIn. LinkedIn is, uh, is usually really good too. Missy just put in her LinkedIn uh, profile address for anybody. Hey, Laura, how about for you? Yeah, I think, I think LinkedIn is a really easy way to start. And then if it's a, if it requires a bigger conversation, maybe moving into email or whatever could work best after that. And Ranjit, how about for yeah, you? I would say the same, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, I see people are, oh, she's just put in her Twitter. Okay, great. Well, once again, guys, I mean, thank you so much. I think this was a really excellent panel. Um, so I can't thank you enough.